The endless array of diets that claim to help you shed pounds tend to fall into two camps, low fat, low carbohydrate. Some companies even claim that genetics can tell us which diet is better for which people. A rigorous recent study sought to settle the debate, and it had results to disappoint both sides. The study's worth a closer look to see what it did and did not prove, and that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Researchers at Stanford University took more than 600 people, which is huge for a nutrition study, aged 18 to 50, who had a body mass index of 28 to 40. 25 to 30 is overweight, and 30 and over is obese. The study subjects had to be otherwise healthy. They couldn't even be on a statin or drugs for type 2 diabetes or hypertension, which might affect weight or energy expenditure. They were all randomly assigned to a healthy low-fat or a healthy low-carbohydrate diet, and they were clearly not blinded to which group they were in. All participants attended 22 instructional sessions over a year in groups of about 17 people. The sessions were held weekly at first, and then were spaced out so that they were monthly in the last six months. Everyone was encouraged to reduce their intake of the avoided nutrient to 20 grams per day over the first eight weeks, and then slowly add the fats or the carbohydrates back into their diets until they reached the lowest level of intake that they believe could be sustained for the long haul. Everyone was followed for a year, which is an eternity in a nutrition study. Everyone was encouraged to maximize vegetable intake, to minimize added sugar, refined flour, and trans fat intake, and to focus on whole foods that were minimally processed. The subjects were also encouraged to cook at home as much as possible. All the participants took a glucose tolerance test as a measurement of insulin sensitivity. Some people believe that insulin resistance or sensitivity may affect not only how people respond to diets, but also how well they adhere to them. The participants were also genotyped because some people believe that certain genes will make people more sensitive to carbohydrates or fat with respect to weight gain. About 40% of the participants had a low-fat genotype and 30% had a low-carbohydrate genotype. Data were gathered at the beginning of the study, at six months, and at a year. And at three unannounced times, researchers checked in on patients to see how closely they were sticking to the instructions. This was a phenomenally well-designed trial, and people did change their diets according to their group assignment. Those in the low-fat group consumed on average 29% of their calories from fats versus 45% in the low-carbohydrate group. Those in the low-carbohydrate group consumed 30% of their calories from carbohydrates versus 48% in the low-fat group. They did not, however, lose meaningfully different amounts of weight. At 12 months, the low-carbohydrate group on average lost just over 13 pounds, compared to more than 11 and a half pounds in the low-fat group the difference was not statistically significant. Insulin sensitivity didn't make a difference. People who secreted more or less insulin lost no more or less weight in general on either a low-fat or a low-carbohydrate diet. Genetics didn't make a difference either. People who had genes that might indicate that they would do better on one diet or the other didn't. In fact, when you look at how every single participant in this study fared on the diet to which he or she was assigned, it's remarkable how both diets yielded an almost identical curvature range of responses from lots of weight loss to a little gained. It wasn't just the averages. Some have taken this to prove that avoiding processed foods, eating more whole foods, and cooking at home leads to weight loss. While I'd like that to be true, because I've advocated that approach here on Healthcare Triage and in an Upshot article on food recommendations and in my recent book, which you should buy, that's not what this study showed. Although the advice was given to all participants, there was no control group in which that advice was omitted, and so no conclusions can be made as to the efficacy of those instructions. Others have taken this study as evidence debunking the idea that counting calories is the key to weight loss. While that wasn't the main thrust of the study, nor the instructions given, participants did reduce their intake by an average of about 500 to 600 calories a day, even if they didn't count them. This study didn't prove the unimportance of calories. The researchers also asked everyone, not just those in the low-carb group, to avoid added sugars. Therefore, we really can't say anything new about added sugars and weight loss above what we've said in many episodes before this. What this study does show is that people who've staked a claim on one diet superiority over another don't have as strong a case as they think. It's hard to overstate how similarly these two diets performed even at an individual level. It shows us that the many people and the many studies suggesting that we can tell which diets are best for you based on genetics or based on insulin levels might not be right either. Almost all of the studies that backed up such ideas are smaller, of shorter duration, and less robust in design than this one. 
Granted, it's still possible that there might be some gene discovered in the future that makes a difference, but those who think they've found it might want to check their enthusiasm. This study was focused mostly on people who are obese or overweight, so people looking to lose just a few pounds might benefit more from one diet or the other. We don't know. It's also worth noting that the people in this study received significant support on both sides, so the results seen here might not apply to those attempting to lose weight on their own at home. You should be wary of those who tell you that they know what diet is best for you or that there's a test out there to tell you the same. Successful diets over the long haul are most likely the ones that involve slow and steady changes. The simplest approach, and many have spoused it, including me, is to cut out processed foods, think about the calories you're drinking, and try not to eat more than you intend to. The bottom line is that the best diet for you is still the one you'll stick to. No one knows better than you what that diet might be, and you're most likely gonna have to figure that out for yourself. Hey, did you enjoy this video? It really does help if you like or subscribe to the show right down there. And while we've got you, anything you can do to help support the show in other ways is appreciated as well. And one way to do that is patreon.com, a subscription service which allows you, the user, to support the show for as like a little dollar a month. And if you don't want to, that's fine. It will always be free. But if you can, it helps make the show bigger and better. We'd really like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz, Carlos Iergos, and Crafty Geek, and as always, especially, our Surgeon Admiral Sam. Go to Patreon patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Link's also down below. And while we've got you, get any merch you like at httmerch.com and my book, The Bad Food Bible, still out there, still available in stores. Really appreciate it if you pick up a copy.